it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Mm-hmm. It's the epoch of incredulity. Oh my God. That is the perfect foolishness to bring <laughs> to this episode. Soros Prez. I've been saying that. Soros Prez. When I look at my stomach, I just say Soros Prez. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck that was. That's what Queen Charlotte, since she had no heart, which is why I love her. Remember at the beginning when her granddaughter, not not granddaughter, when her daughter-in-law dies in childbirth and her son is like crying because that's sad. And she's just like, Soros press. <laughs> she had no heart. But then, of course, you see her life and it's like, yeah, she built up a pretty tough exterior. Like She was kind of shitty to her children or mean to her children or like. She was impatient with them. But like, I've seen that like on TikTok and memes, like mostly black women being like, bitch, I'm, that's, that is my new thing. Sorrows, prayers. Welcome to Tangentially Speaking, the podcast where we have in-depth and entertaining conversations with some, well, a lot of tangents that always eventually connect two seemingly unrelated topics. I am Nikki. And I'm Nita Sharice. Today we discuss Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story, Shonda Rhimes' latest project the six-episode series starring India Amatifio as the newly minted Queen Charlotte tells the story of her marriage to King George, as well as the challenges she faced both due to her African ancestry and King George's mental illness. We follow the Queen as she strategically forges alliances and asserts her newfound influence. Queen Charlotte premiered on May 4th and is currently streaming on Netflix. All right. So I'll have to tell you, sister, I would not have come to this without your your urging. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you said to watch this because I was thoroughly entertained. Hey, that's so splendid. <laughs> yeah, I just, um, right at the opening, it was. It started to give me Olivia Pope vibes, scandal vibes, and that show scarred me. I don't even think I I uh, watched the final season. Maybe I did. I don't know, but it scarred me. <laughs> Soros press. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just it just scarred me because. You know how like Shonda Rhimes has that thing of like writing diatribes for people. And I'm like, nobody is going to sit there and listen to you talk that long. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so when they were writing, um, writing back from wherever they're coming from, Charlotte and her brother. They and, were, oh, okay. When they were going to, when they were going to go and meet the, uh, that was yes. the princess. Yeah. I, yeah, they were going to go and meet the Dowager Pr- Princess and pretty much be have her be studied like a slave, like show us your teeth. <laughs> oh, my God. God. Yes. I said that in uh, it's in the document in Stray Thoughts. It's like this yes. is being auction block. <laughs> it, it is. But if they were doing all women like that, then OK. Um so, so yeah, as she was writing over, they were starting to have that speech and I'm like, oh God, you know, <laughs> please, let's not. That's so funny. I didn't even, I didn't even pick up on that. It, but it you're goes right. Away. Yeah, <laughs> it, it goes away. And then she actually is writing like the way people normally speak to each other, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, the fact that she was checked like a slip like a slave and then from the gowns they were wearing how could you see whether or not they had birthing hips you couldn't see the hips at all it didn't touch her though like when 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 she said that well there were other times that characters have seen this and it was like i've seen her hips she has birthing hips like she didn't they didn't put their hands on the hips like, <laughs> like that's the bustle shut up <laughs> yeah <laughs> like what are y'all what are y'all doing um and so 
again, as episode one produced, and I'm like, okay, were we inspired by Meghan Markle? Or, and and so then I think talking to you, I'm like, oh, these were real people. Because at the beginning, she says, you know, this story is a lie, but it was based on the truth. And, and so it was amazing to see how much history has actually repeated itself. And then knowing what I know about the royal family, it's like, so y'all are part Black and you gave Meghan Markle that much shit? All of this, all of this in the back of my mind, as well as the parallelism of a lot of what I know recently about Meghan Markle is because of Netflix. So it's like, oh, okay, there's like, there's, at least there's uh, symmetry, sort of. Like to be able to just kind of toggle back and forth, you know, from like my list, (laughs) my Netflix list. And um, yeah, like it, it, and and it does say, uh, any liberties taken are intentional, which I loved because to me that was very dog whistly to the to the people who are poised to just be mad before watching it, which is the same treatment that um, Cleopatra, you know, um, yes. coming soon to tangentially speaking, you know, where people are just like, why are you so angry? You know, and so I loved that she was basically like, yeah, there are going to be some things that we're going to tweak, and it's on purpose, which. Shonda is re- like whatever misgivings someone may have about her. You cannot say that she does not put out gorgeous, sumptuous things. It's like you can be mad, but you can't stop looking at it. Like you know, no. you like it. Bridgerton, like as a whole, is gorgeous. Mm-hmm. It's gorgeous, and I find that it kind of has to be because this is the sugar with the medicine. Uh huh. You know. Um, it's very Mary Poppins. Like this is, this is helping this go down because, but, but what I also do appreciate it is that I didn't have to get into um, my Hamilton stance. Like I'm enjoying this because I do, you know, I do like theater, you know, I like musicals. I'm going to right now for the next two and a half hours or however long the runtime is ignore the fact that these people <laughs> were not these people of color you know, and I, I have to frame it in, uh, this is very, it's inaccurate in a way that is like, if you think too much about it, you get mad. Like, and, and, and you also have to realize that Hamilton, when it was like the, the darling of Broadway was during a time of a different president. And not that like, we didn't know some things, but a lot has changed from like 2016 to, to 2020, at least with this, she took liberties, but, um, and, and we'll link to this in the show notes. There's a lot that she stayed pretty much on track. Yeah. The things that she embellished were, uh, were things that writers do like to make things, you know, to make it interesting. We want you to allow that next episode to load. So yes, we're going to lean hard. But even when she did embellish, there was already a, like a seed there. And so, um, uh, there's a link in our document that that pretty much kind of goes like one one by one like what did Shonda Rhimes show and what was what was the truth of it and she didn't veer too much you know like a, a lot of the things she did were for dramatic effect and we the viewer appreciate that otherwise it would have been like this is this is pretty and boring you know nobody wants that so I think she did I, a good job. I think she did a great job and I I would uh, argue that historical fiction should be her lane, you know, because if if she's going to tell, yeah, yeah if she's going to tell these type, type of stories in, new, in, in this type of way, like, yeah, I want more of this. And, you know, this yes. Queen Charlotte spurred me to watch Br- Bridgerton, but I, um, I did not care for Bridgerton as much because I don't think, like, while it's her production, it's still Shondaland, she wasn't the writer's, and you could tell like the difference between her view you know her views translating through queen charlotte and this other one um all of them are kind of like poster children for imagine a society where we are colorblind you know where we are truly colorblind and we're just focused on the issues affecting this class or that one yeah you know, it, yeah. It's, yeah it's nice but i think i think queen charlotte paid more attention to you know, like, think about this. And and that made me wonder, like, what time in history this is taking place. So I know it's about 1813. Slavery was abolished in 1807. 
and Bridgerton is taking place after this. But yes, it was very much a great experiment, you know, back when Charlotte and, and George got together that, you know, you're having this person of color assume a high, such a high position in um, in British society. And and then um, there's there's, so there's a link in the show notes to the article about the uh, abolition of slavery, because the slaves didn't actually become free, you know, all and throughout until 1838. So they they moved towards towards freedom. Emancipation was seriously all deliberate speed, which means slow as hell. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So. It is interesting then to see, like, if you had enough money, you might could have been like your Dido Bell, you know, or your, um, uh, he's an Igbo guy, um, Oladua Ekiano. Hmm. He is, he was actually kidnapped from a village in Igbo land in Nigeria and sold into slavery. And then, um, eventually bought his own freedom and then wrote one of the first slave narratives. So that I wow. I, have that I did not know list. about him. Yes, there's going to be a link to the show notes and oh, I have that on my reading list. Um, I'm dropping knowledge for y'all. I hope y'all appreciate this. Y'all. When you just talked about um uh the evil gentleman who was kidnapped and then that led to one of the first or the, the first slave narrative or one of the first yeah, one of the first it, slave it, narratives. Yeah. It reminds me of Solomon Northup. He was also someone who was kidnapped. He was not sold. He was tricked into slavery. He played uh he played the violin. Mm-hmm. Um and just th- these different types of stories that are not the same thing. You know, oh I was betrayed, you know, I was betrayed by uh like by my fellow Africans and sold in and like woe is me or whatever. It's just, it's all of these different ways. And because when you start kidnapping people who had agency and who had some form of education, it leads to information at the end of it. It's horrible. It's terrible. It's unfair. But now we have 12 years of slave, which led mm-hmm. to a movie, which, which led to, and it's important to get these things out here because our students, not just black students, American children, children across the world need to see, look at all of the different ways slavery impacted different types of people, which leads to different types of media, which leads to all of this art. Born and raised in West Africa, Omar Ibn Said was 37 years old when he was kidnapped and taken to America as a slave in the 1800s. Before I came to the Christian country, My religion was the religion of Muhammad. His autobiography in his native language of Arabic is believed to be the only one of its kind, the original words of a Muslim American slave. Then there came to our place a large army who killed many men and took me and brought me to the great sea. His literacy and culture uh, completely goes against, abolishes, one might say annihilates the, the narrative that slaves were not capable of culture. In fact, they were persons with, uh, with distinct histories, abilities, culture, and background. And he was highly educated because in his autobiography, he speaks about spending 25 years studying and shipped off to South Carolina. And just all of this information that is stifled because of fear and because of the knowing that they had that these people are great. <laughs> you know that they have that they have contributed to the foundation of so much in this uh world that movie uh which i'm very upset that this movie is already it already seems to be out of theaters at, at least in this area but chevalier it was released i believe on april 21st it's already gone and okay. i i i didn't know that napoleon that the reason why we don't know about him is that napoleon intentionally erased him I thought it was the usual, which I mean, I guess the usual is due to the um, to the intentional erasure of our contributions. But this is like it's in black and white. It is in print. If, if you Google it, he was so he was impressed that he was scared. He erased him from the books. It's why we don't know anything about this man who was exactly. very real. But also, 
I don't know of too many movies that in about three weeks, it's gone. And I was really surprised that in New Orleans, it's like this dovetails so nicely with yeah, everything. You know, um, Joseph Ballone, I believe his uh, name was, reminds me of Edmund Dede, which was a free man of color in New Orleans who never got to hear his music be performed. He was so talented and he, he had, he had like, he had one of those lives where he kind of lost it because just at every turn he was stopped. We need to know about this. We need to know about this and we need to know about it. Like at the same time, we're learning about Queen Charlotte. Well, who is Dido? Who's Dido Elizabeth Bell. Then at the same time, how does the Igbo man fit in? Um, and I forgot his name. I, uh, I, I forgot. Uh, Echiano. Yes. How does Echiano fit in? How does Edmund Dede fit in? How does Chevalier, Joseph Ballone fit in? What is happening at these same times? And just like you said, slavery was abolished, but then they weren't actually free until 1838. But that reminds yeah. me of Juneteenth. It's yeah, the same the thing. Same thing. <laughs> There's a teacher right now in Florida who is under investigation because she showed a Disney movie in which there is a gay character. And it's a, it is a Disney movie that's very, very recent. Um, and that is, there are just so many layers there because you've got Disney, you've got Florida. There's a lot happening with the DeSantis and Disney and Disney being like, what you're not going to do is, you know, cause it's like, come on, Disney owns Florida. <laughs> it's its own, you know, and I have my feelings yeah. about Disney, but there's a lot happening there. And so when I read that story, I'm like, there's a lot happening with, you know, this teacher being under investigation in a state that is run by Ron DeSantis, who is, who has beef with Disney. You can't tell me that there's not a reason for that. That's deeper than just messing with this woman who showed a Disney movie to her class. Yeah. It's all a part of this, this it's chess all- game. And then if you, if you pan out wider, I just posted that link on Facebook about Texas you know, voting, the bill hasn't, I don't, I don't think it's actually been signed into law yet, but I know that I believe it passed where they're talking about uh, taking the power, certain um, government powers away from cities. So Austin, Dallas, Houston, I believe those are all democratically run cities. And no, Austin is, yeah. Yeah, so a sweeping Texas bill stripping authority from cities passed the state Senate on Tuesday is now headed to the governor's desk. So all he has to do is sign it into law. This bill takes large domains of municipal governing from payday lending um, laws to rest break regulations for construction workers to um, hair discrimination, determining whether a woman can be discriminated against based on her hair. It's out of the taking it, take all those powers out of the hands of the state's largely democratic run cities and shift them to the legislature, which is Republican, uh, the legislature, which is Republican control. So I said, you know, just like pay attention because just like the states like that were setting the, the framework for Roe v. Wade to be abolished. Yes. Um, one of my friends said, hey, next Georgia is on the list. You know it because Kemp has been. He's been mad at Atlanta, (laughs) Atlanta mayors. That's why him and Keisha Lance Bottoms, (laughs) you know, it's folks, you can't just watch TV. We watch TV, (laughs) but we're not watching it in a vacuum. And I urge everybody, don't just watch TV in the vacuum. And even though news is aggravating, pay attention to your local news, but also pay attention to news coming out of other other states because it's it's all connected (laughs) it's all connected they're trying to take us back they're trying to make america great again they're trying to take us back to the to the dark ages because right now it's hard to compete with these educated people of color (laughs) and they don't want that anymore (laughs) <laughs> and every and everything truly is connected and everything truly is action and reaction. Because while you're talking about these educated people of color, who's the most educated demographic? Black women are the most educated group in the U.S. Women outnumber men on many college campuses, making up 50%, 57% of college students. 
some studies show that black women are the most educated group in the US, but what does this mean for opportunities, wages and quality of life? So I was just having a conversation um, with Snack Daddy, Snack Daddy. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, the other day and we were going back and forth cause you know, we were kind of, I was talking about like, you know, black women are intersectional. And so um, when we say the problems that are happening to us, I would really appreciate if black men would listen, but y'all got this issue because you're, you and white women are two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. You've got like one foot in that, that white privilege, you know, uh, bucket. And, and so um, I was saying like, you know, black women make the least amount of money, you know, uh, black women are disenfranchised here, how many black women are killed per day. And he was like, well, I'm gonna push back a little bit on this um, because like, according to my uncle, you know, with, with, with regard to employment specifically, um, black women tend to be uh, more employed than black men. And I'm like, but what? Like we weren't even allowed. You look at the history of Jim Crow and all of that stuff. Before that, we weren't even allowed to hold jobs. We wouldn't. Even, we couldn't even collect our own paychecks. That's for women across the board, you know. And I said the type of jobs we were getting were domestic jobs, either as a laundress or somebody's housekeeper, or whatever. So we were going back and forth on that. And I'm like, well, let me go to the Google. <laughs> so I go to the Google, and I found this article um, about how. Indeed, he was a little bit right. Black women were uh, tended to be hired more than black men um, on certain jobs, but they were the low wage earning jobs. And mm -hmm. it was because they didn't see black women as mothers. And so when they didn't want black That's so women- That's wild. Because, wow. Okay, because yeah. They didn't want black men getting a job and then marrying black women and having those women stay at home like they're like white women do. You know, white women, a lot of a high percentage of white women, usually when they get married and they have kids, they don't they don't work. They are the they are they have time to be room parents and uh, parent professionals and shit, <laughs> making that little bit of money. If we're working moms, bitch, you're supposed to be working. Not, oh, you know, let's support your motherhood. Yep. <laughs> and so I you know, I shared that article with him and I had like I mean, what I just told you earlier, you know, have it being being done to you by someone who's supposed to be your partner. Yeah. And, you know, who's saying I would rather rather have you out of the house and working than actually helping our kids you know, uh, be the best versions of themselves and experience the best of Amer the American school system like their white counterparts do. Right. <laughs> which is, which is, which just contributes to that whole thing with us just as a whole, not being like adored, like look yeah. at just like, oh, like not that I want to be viewed as weak, but that's why we, you know, there are so many black women pushing back now against like the strong black black woman. Like it's put into you as a little girl, like that we're that we can take it, and that branches off into so many other things, like going into labor or just going to the doctor in general. Like all of that, it's like you're a workhorse. You're not a woman, and so it's wild to me that we're not seen as mothers when it's like, yeah, but we took care of all of your kids. We nurse, they used to sell us as wet nurses. Yes. You know? And then Which, also- If I'm racist against somebody, I, I like, what is that about? I, I I don't want your milk going through my child. If I am three-fifths human, and I'm like, that shows right there that you know that that's not true. But then we also drink cow's milk. So, I mean, if we're animals, then our milk is comparable to that of a cow's, right? It's It's- it's just none of it makes sense. Like your like your racism, like it doesn't even have like like rules. <laughs> like it it isn't it doesn't make sense. There is no structure. It's like, okay, so either I'm lazy or I'm a super hard worker. 
you know, we're always seen as like, we can take so much, but then we can't do anything. Like, which is it? And it's whatever it is that like, that fits your fancy at the time. That, that reminds me of it. And I just, I just found the link and I, I put it in the notes. Reminds me of that thing where I believe it's 1915 or 1918, 1918, where after the first world war, there were, you know, men were returning home and like everybody else, women had been working. Well, they'd made a big deal about women working. It was white women working. And now they were able to stay at home. White women started getting upset that they couldn't find domestics because black women who were married and who were having kids and who were about to experience middle class were staying home. And they were like, well, how dare you be a stay at home wife or a stay at home mother? And they put a law that like we, we had to work so that they could do what they had to do. And it is, there's a tweet about it, but then that led me to the actual thing. And so the thing that I'm, um, that I'm linking to is the NAACP telegram regarding forced labor of women, 1918 record of rights. And I learned about that on TikTok about a year ago, about how they, and it reminds me of the Tino law where it's like, ah, the white men are paying too much attention. Do, do something. So now we can't cover our hair. It's the constant policing. They were basically like, where do you get the goal to not come answer this job? Like they could not figure out like, why aren't people responding to these? Cause they didn't need to. Cause for like the first time that was enough money for them to stay home. They didn't like that. So they, they forced it like, no, you have to be working. So don't tell. And, and this is what people do not know. This is what they don't know, but we're lazy. Yeah. Girl, <laughs> it's, it's fucking wild that we're here right now. It is, yeah. it is, it is wild. Not only that we are here, but that we're not just like killing people every day. Yeah. I mean, how are we not like, how are we not like how I wake up and I'm not about to go on a next stabbing spree. Like just, just, ah, ah, ah. I mean, Since 2010, our publication has been fully committed to excellence in establishing and expanding hatred and contempt for Black, cisgender, and transgender women everywhere. Whether extolling advice to passport bros on how to score submissive, non-English speaking wives, or providing a comprehensive guide on how to safely eat glizzies and popsicles in public, we're serious about upholding patriarchy, and we are willing to go anywhere to do it. So if that means sponsoring a podcast featuring two proud, progressive Black women who are sick of our shit, then we're willing to pay cash money to round up and convert every boss bitch we can. Misogynoir Monthly. We're everywhere we need to be to keep Black women down. R.I.P. to Tevin Bamuels. You are greatly missed. So, anyway... Episode one, I was just like, oh, okay. I had someone to hate. Because what, what? She is so cute. Th their little their little meeting. She's trying to climb over the wall. He comes out. He's he's a looker. She's a looker. You she know. doesn't know who he is. Yeah. And, and then, so they find each other and you like, there's vibes. There's like, mm -hmm. a, there's connectivity and everything. And then he going to drop her off at the crib and be like, yeah. <laughs> You stay over there, bitch. I'm gonna be over here. <laughs> I I literally typed, I hate George. <laughs> yeah, I was I like, what is going on? Because it was yeah. so different. I was like, is he yeah. bipolar? Like it, he was just another person. <laughs> like, what? Uh, what's happening? But um, so then that that made me appreciate the episode where it was a little tiring because it went through everything that you just saw, but it was from his point of view. It was yeah. like, yeah, just tell her. But but then I was mad because it's like, I thought it was interesting. Like she was like, you said that she was brown, but like she wasn't too brown. And it made me wonder what was the impetus for choosing her. Well, actually, though, in this show, they make it seem like the princess scoured the earth or whatever and then called for her and he didn't really know about it. One of the videos that I linked to and was reading, it says that he did, that yeah. he chose her okay. so I kind of wondered like okay this is a white this is a white British woman like she's talking about oh you didn't say that she was like this brown and I'm thinking I 
would think she wouldn't want any brown. So then that kind of like sent me down because she knows her son has problems. Was it like, you know, a really good quality one wouldn't want this. So like, let me just get somebody who should feel lucky to have him. It's like, why did you choose her to have the dud king? Like, you know that he has these problems. Why? But then I start reading and it's, and it said that he chose her. Like it, it didn't seem like it was, the way that they did this was like, she did a, like a national search, found her and then told him you're getting married. And the way I read it in one of the many videos or articles, and it's just linked in there somewhere, is that he wanted her or he chose her. I, what I took from it, like just based on the show alone, it was as much a political move as it was like, you know, where will this couple work out? Because, you know, the, the backdrop of the show is, are these relationships going to work out? <laughs> like, how are they going to survive the pressures of this, this world and class and these changing social dynamics and all of that? And, you know, these are, these are love stories where, yeah. where you're, we're hoping and wanting for them to make it. And I got sucked in as well. Like even in, 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 during Bridgerton to a lesser extent than Queen Charlotte, but I was just like, I want their love to survive. Like, oh like, girl, Bridgerton the first real. season. John, I don't know how to say his name, but and that's not, not even usually my uh no, it's not, not it's usually that, my but right oh here. my god. It's like, what is it about this? He's very it's like there's a million people walking around here like now, but I'm like, okay, this dude is meant for the camera. I don't know what it is, but like that is that is just not usually my type. It's a little bit too pretty. Like I don't, I don't usually like that. Like I like somebody that looks like Listen, I built you a, a car. It's outside. I'm going to take a shower. That's what I like. <laughs> yeah, no, that dude he, from Bridgerton, he smolders. Yes, he, he is the literal, like, and then the British, oh my God. So I was so upset when he, uh, he did not make even an appearance, but that's before I realized the setup of the books is every kid gets their own book. So they don't usually cross over uh, as much. That's why they just had Daphne pop up in the second season, like with the little mixed baby, like, oh, how's everything going? And then like in this one, we see uh, the mother, which I thought that was a nice little, I liked that storyline with the lady Danbury and Daphne's yeah. mom, Cecilia. Yes. Like, and I don't understand how, I, I wasn't shocked by it, but it took me a little bit. Normally I would have picked up on something like that, but it took me a little bit before I realized, oh, she's the little girl. And they weren't hiding the name. I don't know how I didn't. Yeah. Violet, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, oh, so I'm like, I must be so engrossed. I was doing like a little work, but I was paying attention to the show more because it took me way longer to do what I was doing because I was in it. Normally, I would have peeped that from the beginning. I'm like, I must really just be like, I was just so fascinated by Queen Charlotte and I love the friendship with she and Lady Danbury. Yeah. Um, and I love the conversations they had because I'm so like, real. Yes, I'm like, this is what, this is how, like, it's why it's so important to have Black writers writing these shows so that they can infuse those conversations. Because, you know, again, like, what we do, our culture, what we do, what we say to each other is ours, but y'all need to know. <laughs> y'all need to know what really goes on. And, and understand where we're coming from, the nuance of just being the being the black couple that throws the first ball of the season, you know, as a way to usher in, you know, or to to uh, for, the, for these people to understand that this experiment <laughs> is all right. It's OK. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, it, was, it was so good. Like their, their their conversations just reminded me of like these are workplace conversations. Your good, good, best good girlfriend, black girlfriend at work, and how you talk after the big meeting where you've done like what you, and then it's like, girl, that PowerPoint, girl, what she do? Girl, what initiative? It's, it's like, it's, it was just so real. I like how she got her together mm -hmm. at times where she was like, you are not a simpering girl. Like, because I liked how they showed, they, they both had privilege, but Queen Charlotte, she was already a, a princess where she came from. So even though it was a small province in Germany, she still had some privilege. So I like how Lady Danbury had to tell her like, you don't realize like 
this is a come up for all of us. She's basically like, you have a responsibility to like get on your shit, get it together because she was kind of blinded because she is above all else. She's a Royal. And so she felt like, Oh, these little things, like this is just affecting me. I'm making these decisions for me. And Lady Danbury is like, no, it's reflecting on all of us. You have a chance to actually usher something in. And those are real conversations that I feel probably happen in Hollywood with our favorite stars. Or if one person gets in and it's like, it's that pivotal point that only non-white people experience. Do I open the door and let everybody else in? Or am I going to take the attitude of, I don't want to mess up my standing. So like, I'm going to close the door. It, it, It was just so like, this is all real. None of it felt contrived. Um, I like how they infuse some modern things, but it didn't go overboard. Like when she's fussing at her brother and she says something like, if this doesn't go my way, I will bounce. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure they didn't say bounce no. back, back then, but it didn't sound crazy. Like it didn't, it had me thinking like, wait, is bounce one of those words that I'm going to think is a new way, but like they've been doing it, it actually comes from something else. I don't know, like they used to bounce shit off slaves heads. Cause anything that's old, I figure is probably like related to slavery somehow. <laughs> But you know that bounce comes when it's like, oh, we got to stop saying bounce. <laughs> and that's why you are all so good at basketball. Sorrows, press. <laughs> Welcome to my brain. <laughs> wild, wild place. <laughs> it truly is. But yeah, that uh, their their friendship, I really, really appreciated. I liked how she got in Lady Danbury's ass about, bitch, if you're going through shit, you better let me know. Like, yeah. she fussed at her. She's like, I'll, I'll handle it. And she's like, no, like, she got on her and then she had the chance to turn it around. Like, you just said that I wielded all this power, that I had this influence. You can use it for yourself. I think that Lady Danbury carried herself well dealing with that bitch Dowager Princess. You know, I did appreciate when Dowager Princess was like, okay, let me be real with you, bitch, because I'm having a good time fighting you. <laughs> like, you give me life. Yes, I so, love that. So, like, I, yeah, I was just like, okay, you know, if this is, if this is what sisterhood between a white woman and a black woman is going to be. I will take that. I will take that. It's like, because at least you're being real with me. You and know, we speak each other. Exactly. And, and that she, she was, I like how she she said, okay, like I'm a woman. I've been going through shit too. Like, I don't know what your your pain is about. Let me tell you the pain I've been through. So this is how we're gonna be gonna relate. Yes. I, I, <laughs> like, I was like, oh, it makes me kind of not like her, but I respect it's just her. more realistic. Yeah. Because it's it she isn't like, you know, I mean she's evil, but it she's not an extreme. She's not like this weird ally that would never have existed back then. And then she's also not like I'm burning every nigga bitch I see at the stake. Like, it was just like, we are both operating within this system yeah. that was created by them. And yeah. uh, and she, like, she could see that Lady Danbury was, she was cunning. And I like that she acknowledged that, you know? And she's like, don't, oh, don't cry. Don't cry. Because you can see that the princess was going through her own stuff with these men undermining her. It's like, this is my fucking son. I know what's going on. And they're like, do we need to call? Like they were constantly threatening to like let other people know. And it's like, they ain't treating her like a child. She's running all of y'all. And like, there were scenes where she'd be like, oh, I mean, uh, I'm a woman and I don't know. And it's like, y'all can't tell she's lying. When she said, well, I'm female and you know, we don't remember. <laughs> I'm like, I want to say that all the time. Yes. <laughs> That's one of those times where I'm like, I'm glad for the progress, but I kind of want the days where they were so dumb and thought that we were so dumb. We could just get away with saying stupid shit like that. Like if I were to do that now, I'm to be like, the fuck are you up to? Like you would <laughs> never say that. What, what, who is it? Where is my wife? But I, it was just so funny because she didn't even try, which just highlights how stupid they are. It's like yeah. you had previous conversations with this woman. She's orchestrating all of this. How did she just all of a sudden have female amnesia? <laughs> Y'all are stupid. Now, how did how did you feel about Lady Danbury's husband? Oh, goodness. Oof. I mean, all I thought, like, I think I wrote, like, 
Man, Lady Agatha is a good one because I could not fuck her husband with somebody else's pussy even. That's what I wrote on my notes. I feel bad for this like, girl, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was offended. Yes. That's a, like, that's a like, way I it. was like, yeah, he was disgusting. I I wrote, okay. And straight thoughts, the first one was Soros Press. And then I have <laughs> Lady Danbury's husband was extremely upsetting. He looked like a bizarro 18th century JJ. I dynamite, sir. <laughs> like he looked yeah, like, like Jimmy Walker. But it also felt like he was being uh lampooned a little bit. Yeah. He looked like when you um, look at those really old comics, like political cartoons. Yes. Because like at one point it's like, why are his lips that red? Is it lined with charms blow pop? It It looked like the inspiration for blackface. He looked like the inspiration. Yeah. And I feel like. Yeah. I was offended because I felt like doing something like this, but not doing it well. It is the same as how the people who made those cartoons feel about black people. He's dark yeah. skinned. I was just, I was very bothered by how he looked. Yeah. It's like y'all went above and beyond to like, because I feel like that man does not look like that. No. <laughs> like, no. it's like, no. no, he, and it was scary. So, yeah, I want to reassure myself that that man doesn't look that way in real life by pulling up a, a picture of him now. Cyril in, in re or Enri, He's Nigerian born British. No, he does not look like that in real life. And it was just, it was too much. It was, it was too much. And I was just like, what was the point? I don't know why he portrayed that role in that way. Um, It was weird. And I'm not sure why anyone co-signed that. Uh, I didn't like it. Um, By episode two, I was just like, yeah, if he's going to die, it would be great if he died soon because I don't want to look at him anymore. I Well, I knew he was going to die. Well, because I'd already watched Bridgerton and in Bridgerton, Lady Danbury is like, oh, it's this bad bitch that don't have no man. She just has money. And I don't know if they like mentioned like, or I just assume I'm sure she had a husband or, or something. And so I was waiting. I was like, oh, he's, he, they, he's going to die. I did like how, like, I liked the relationship between her and her, and her maid, like where her maid would be like, I'm so sorry. It's like she's like taking these baths and just like that she that she sympathized with her. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It sounds like he wants to fuck. I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, it was like, you know, you just need to have that. You need to have somebody that you can like share glances with and just have some kind of relationship, you know. And um, yeah, like I, I liked her storyline. I actually at some points felt like. I don't know if they'll do it now, but like if they can have one that's maybe it's still Queen Charlotte, but we focus only on Lady Danbury, like that actress, just that whole thing. She was I kind of feel like they told like a little bit too much of her story. Like, I don't know what new thing they would have to say now, because she really did get like it feels like sometimes equal screen time. So I don't know what else they could do. I feel like everything's kind of been revealed, but. That was really good. Like, I sometimes enjoy that more than Queen Charlotte because with Queen Charlotte, it's historical. So, like, it was kind of the the same thing. Her dealing with this and being miserable and having, like, very infrequent moments of happiness with this person that she's kind of stuck with. But the Dowager Princess and Lady Danbury, that was dynamic. Like, it it could go forth and, you know, if I had to pick, I I, I would want to play Lady Danbury because... There's so much like there's so much up and down and she's just so smart and and just oh. understands like how things work. And, you know, when she taught when she explained her background, how like she was raised from a certain age to be this man's wife, I would watch that show like I, I was right. It. So I'm hoping yeah, that, I forgot about her. that y'all. Hello. Lady Danbury is one of the things that isn't real. So okay. they very well could have planted that seed for something. Because, you know, that's Shonda, what she does. I hope she did. Because I, I mean, like I said, Shonda, historical fiction, that's your bag, baby. Do that shit. Like, keep Shonda, on doing if it. you ever want to do something on the free people of color in New Orleans, hello. Hello. Hello, Shonda. Come on in. 
<laughs> Come and visit us down at 2336 Esplanade Avenue. Yes. Museum. Come on, Shonda, because that's right up her lane. How do we rate this show? Five stars. Five stars. I watched it. I started watching it in the evening, like eight o'clock, nine o'clock. I watched it in one sitting, all the episodes. Mm. I went to bed at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was working on something, but I barely, you know, this does not fall into the category of watch it while you're doing work. I was doing work, but I was watching it more. And then sometimes it was that kind of work, but um, I enjoyed it and I appreciate it because it sparked my interest in other figures, other European black people, which, um, I linked to everything. I was very good with my links this week. Did it when I thought about it. Like there's a book called European Africans that I've had in my wish list forever that I'm going to go ahead on and download now. Um, I ran into Dido Elizabeth Bell, which is someone that I never knew about. I've seen that painting, but didn't know what it was about. And so um, in the show notes, you will find a document of this British show called Perspectives that does like, um, it's almost like art mysteries. They, they solve mysteries of things. And so there's a painting with this white woman and then there's a black woman that's right there. And it's a big deal because blacks and whites were never depicted in art, like as being on the same. Mm -hmm. And to me, she's going to look quite equal, but I guess she's not a maid. She's not like on the ground with her hands clasped or in chains. But she's like, she's like sticking her hand out like, "Mm." she looks like she's having fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like. And so um, they just, they kind of went back and they got the history of that, which led me to this movie, Belle, that I've always known about. And I knew that um, Gugu, Gugu Mbatha Rao, who played in um, Beyond the Lights and this Apple show called uh, The Morning Show. She's on that um, with Steve Carell. And so I knew that she was in that movie and I saw it and I just remember thinking like, oh, this is some Sally Hemming stuff. And I just didn't, I didn't realize that it was about a European black person and that it was true. So uh, I watched that and it was, it was good. Like it was in 2014. Uh, My only complaint about it was that I wish that I wish it was a little bit longer and I wish it had gone deeper, but it's definitely worth checking out. There's a lot of little instances that happen in there that it's like, nothing has changed. There were echoes of like what Meghan Markle goes through. There were echoes of just like us seen as being um, this, exotic tawdry type thing there's different types of white men in it because she ended up marrying uh a lawyer um Mm -hmm. a white man who was a son of a preacher and he was pretty uh radical and so um yeah it was it, it was good and so now that's like another avenue that i'm like okay i need to read about you know black black people and and then that part i don't know as much as i should so i I didn't expect to give this five stars, but absolutely five stars. I did not fall asleep at any point. I had to watch it in two sittings um, because it was my weekend with the kids. So I watched like four episodes one night and then the last two, the the second night. By episode six, my notes was, God damn it, this show made me cry. I do. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. Um, love what Agatha Dansbury told her son she was like honey you know who you are you're from Sierra Leone you came from royalty way before we even came to this land you you gonna be you know you gonna be somebody regardless to what anyone's I'm like yes yes I'm here for all of that and then I actually like what Charlotte said you take someone in marriage and you choose to love them because it's a choice every fucking day yes yeah. Not just at the altar. Every day is a no choice. No soulmate shit. There's no just magical. No. Yes. You make your decision just like you make decisions about everything else. You know what? I completely forgot about that part with her son. Two things to say about that. Number one, it made me think about you. I was like, <laughs> this is this is Nikki and her sons. I completely forgot about that. And also that kind of reinforces that I wouldn't be surprised if they are working on something about her because that's a lot of detail. Not that she wasn't an important character, but that's the second time that there's something that sets up um, a backstory because I was intrigued just the relationship or non-relationship she kind of has with her kids mm-hmm. kind of like made me sad but then it's like well looking at the time and her position 
I guess it's normal, but you could tell that it kind of bothered her. So that warrants learning a little bit more like why exactly is it this way? But then when she turned to him and told him that, she's not cold. Like, I, I, I think it's an attitude of, I want to prepare you. I think she's like just one of those severe people. Like, I need to be ready for the world. So I'm going to regard you like other people will. You know, so that made me want to know more about her and what her parenting, uh, her childhood experience was like with her parents. So I'm really hoping that we see that actress because she's just great, just on screen. I can't yes. stop looking at her. She's great. Oh, um, yes. Her, the, the lady that plays young Agatha Dansbury, love her. Arsima Thomas. Yep. Okay. Yes. Love her. And I want to see more of her. Make it happen. Anyway. Girl, I gotta go. Is that our show? That is our show. Sora's prize. Sora's prize. Thank you for listening to Tangentially Speaking. This podcast is recorded and produced by Nita Sharice and Nikki Ebo. Our theme music is Lush Living by Martin Landstrom. Our artwork was created by Prime Vice Studios. You can learn more about this intellectual property development agency at primevice.com. Find us on your favorite podcast player and YouTube. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. And be sure to follow us on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter.